Good morning, everyone. Um, okay, uh, my name is Michael Early. Probably some of you would be aware of me. I work for uh, Scott Town Walker Architects. Uh, we're um, probably one of the larger uh, architectural firms in Ireland at the moment. Um, I have about, uh, I'm a graduate of DIT and uh, Trinity College. Um, I have about 20 years' experience at the moment uh, in the, I suppose, the construction business, uh, having worked on various stages of uh, uh, a lot of projects, uh, some small, uh, a lot, very large, uh, in both Ireland and in the UK. Uh, so I've had a few hats over the years, architectural technologist, uh, CAD manager, uh, software engineer, uh, software systems manager, so overlooking software for our office. and. Uh, now the latest one is Project Information Manager, which um, it's most of my role at the moment is trying to be an overarching role, trying to encourage uh, a sort of a, um, more information managers to run the projects in our office because uh, everything is, is going that way. Okay, so in Scott Town Walker we have a, a BIM steering group, uh, which I'm leading uh, on that. and. Uh, this year, there'll be a lot of focus on that, and I would recommend it uh, as a way of um, promoting BIM within your organisations, is to just knock some heads together. Meet every, we meet every two weeks, and uh, we basically outline the things that need to be done, uh, prioritise them when they need to be done, and just get people to do them, and uh, arrive at the meeting with some solutions to those problems, rather than trying to uh, resolve them all at the meeting. Um, Okay, so uh, I take an overview then on all matters relating to BIM, uh, from procurement uh, to handover. And as Paul said, it's, it's a lot about procurement uh, in the BIM process. Um, uh, but it's, it's procurement heading towards the right information at handover. Okay. So uh, other things I do is uh, do a lot to do with software and I look after the website. That's just a, a side issue. Um, so also I'm lecturing on uh, the master's course in building informatics uh, uh, run by CETA. Um, I'm on the committee as well for uh, the BIM committee and I'll get to this at the end. We produced a document which is a, a template uh, for a BIM execution plan. This will be the first of uh, <coughs> a few documents we're going to produce which will be guidance documents uh, for the industry. Um, and I think you'll probably all get a, a copy uh, of this um, at the end, um, not physically, it'll be probably uh, emailed to you. Um, so um, I've been an external examiner, DIT, and I do some software development as well. Uh, so I have a strong interest, I suppose, in the information that's in BIM, uh, whereas traditionally I think the uh, designers would be looking at it in terms of 3D. Um, I'm very interested in terms of the, the information that's in there, that it's standardised, that it's... Uh, meets the employer's information requirements, that meets the COBE standards and so on, because at the end of the day, it is about the information that's handed over. Uh, a lot of clients actually, while there might be, you know, there's a bit of wow factor with the 3D, uh, the actual information in that is going to be the key to it. Okay, so just initially, i just give you some, these, these are some projects we've done over the years, uh, which weren't done in BIM. Uh, the, so we've been working on some very large projects the Aviva Stadium, which is one of the top left, you're probably all familiar with it, it's uh, uh, in Dublin. Um, that wasn't done in BIM, but what we used was, we used uh, one of the members of the project team, uh, was a member of the Avanti group at the time, uh, who produced a document that became uh, sort of the VS uh, 1192 standard. And we used uh, a naming system uh, for files that we standardised for all the design team and the contractor and the subcontractor. So everyone basically used a common naming system. And it's very similar to the BS system, just slight deviation, but every <coughs> file name that we produced began with STW. If another company, uh, Cisco, I think one of the contractors produced a, a document there, or SSK. So immediately on the system, we used an A-side system to upload the documents. So we could actually search for documents by putting in the first three letters, we'd know who uh, did the document. We had them all typed as well, so we could actually say, look, I want to see all CIS documents that are uh, to do with procurement or so on. So it was actually a good <coughs> system, and everyone got with it. Uh, a little bit of pain always at the beginning, but at the end, when you had, we had, I can't remember, it was, it was tens of thousands of documents at the end, it was uh, extremely beneficial. The combination of having 
an online system and a standardised numbering system worked out really well. Um, um, the, just some other projects there we've done over the years. We've done East Point Business Park. We've done uh, small projects like the Gate Theatre. Uh, it's just a, a small extension to the, to the building. Uh, the um, Irish Lights building, Matter Hospital. So these have all mostly been done in TD. Now, everything we're doing now, pretty much, apart from one or two projects, is BIM. So it's quite a substantial change for us. Uh, but we're, we're gearing up towards it. And uh, we're seeing that it's uh, because we do a lot of work in the UK as well, that this is just a thing we have to get on with. We can't be kind of going, oh, it's too hard, it's, uh, it's too difficult. Uh, we're now trying to get all these changes pulled back into our ISO system as well. We've been audited now today, and uh, we'd like to get really uh, the, these systems become now the way we do work, and they become auditable. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to give you just a little overview, I suppose, of where BIM is at. I'll try not to copy too much of what Paul has done, uh, but where it's at in the UK, Northern Ireland. Ireland and Europe, just to give you a feel um, where it's at. So BIM Level 2 will be mandatory for UK projects which require central funding from uh, the 1st of January next year. There's no minimum threshold for funding, so basically it's every project. Uh, it's every designer, every contractor, everyone who's producing design information uh, will need to do BIM. That's a, it's a tall task, um, but uh, I think what's going to happen is that uh, in some ways, there'll be certain companies, and probably larger ones, who'll come up to the task uh, and just get on with it. And there'll be a lot of probably medium and small ones who are going to find it uh, more difficult. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. So about 40% of all capital expenditure uh, on construction in the UK is from this public funding. So if you decide that you don't want that 40%, of the chunk, um, and you do hospitals or schools or third level education buildings, courts, libraries, prisons, public libraries, the list goes on, uh, you count yourself out basically for that work. Um, so it's, um, you know, if you want to do commercial speculative work only, um, then, you know, you're in that 60% and you'll be okay for another while. But it's going to be difficult. Uh, as we've seen in the downturn, a lot of people go for uh, that work, the private work tends to to uh, get more scarce and everyone goes for the public work so you'll find um, it very difficult to get that. The other thing I'd say is it's going to get more difficult over time to ramp yourself up. If you don't ramp yourself up this year and you're doing it next year you're going to be behind. Um, a, lot of, a lot of it's about procurement as well so we're now getting in uh, capability assessment forms that are getting tougher and tougher. Initially it was, do you do BIM? And the next is now, what projects have you done BIM in the last one year, in the last three years? The next questions I'm sure are going to be, uh, what projects have you done in BIM, let's say in healthcare in the last uh, three years? Uh, so it's a way of, uh, they'll be filtering down basically. It's another way of sort of weeding out in some ways. So you've got to decide, do you want to get on board on this? So it's an important decision to be made. Okay. So still, 6%, uh, as I said, will be privately funded projects. Uh, that's, I'm sure it's a rounded sort of estimate and it'll go up and down as uh, the economies go up and down. So it'll become increasingly difficult for organisations and a mixture of public and private work to maintain BIM and non-BIM processes. Uh, so what we're finding at the moment is that uh, <coughs> we cannot maintain two systems. We can't have the AutoCAD-based system, uh, which we use, and the Revit-based system. Uh, where, you, where Autodesk uh, sort of site, but it's, uh, it's, it's not so much, I suppose, about uh, the software, it's about the process. The process of how we produce information. Uh, we're now in BIM starting to produce models, extracting views from the models, uh, schedules from those models. Uh, we need to basically have an EIR, we need to respond with a BIM execution plan, so on. It's a whole process that's so different the way uh, it was done previously and it's just going to be too difficult for us to maintain that system and the previous systems we had. The one benefit of BIM in some ways and the past 1192 and the BS standards is they are systems, they're documented, um, there will be over this year uh, guidance documents as well coming from the institutes uh, on how to actually manage that. So it's going to be more documented than it was previously. Um, so that's 
good news in some ways. So there's some help out there. Um, so many large organisations uh, are now strategically making the change to be 100% BIM. Uh, I suppose I'm a little biased because we're a large architectural firm in Ireland, not as large in the UK, but we're uh, punching a bit above our weight. Um, but the people I've been talking to in companies like ARP and Bureau Hapold and so on, they're keen to get everything standardised. They're <coughs> seeing that it's a problem trying to keep two systems going as well. Uh, that's, that's costing money. Um, so there's uh, a change uh, to move to 100% BIM systems. Went to one meeting there uh, recently and uh, you know, there's always this thing, do we have a common numbering system and so on? If we do, what do we agree? And we sat down the meeting really quickly and they said, are you using the BS 1192 numbering? And uh, they said, yes. And I said, all we have to do now is agree just the codes we use and uh, a couple of codes and we had it done in two minutes. You know, it was just simple, you know. So I said, look, why don't we do that for every project? You know, that's, that's it. You know, it doesn't matter if it's BIM or not. We'll just name all our files uh, using the BS system. Um, and then there's no issue. Everyone gets familiar with it and they won't even think about it. Okay. So going forward, there'll be an expectation then that other project team members will use similar systems um, because it saves time, effort, money, and so on. Okay, so when BEM becomes more popular throughout Europe, uh, I think the UK will have a head start, and I think uh, organisations in Ireland that are actually getting with it as well will have a head start because eventually it's going to proliferate. Um, uh, it's going to happen in uh, you know all the countries around Europe, and you imagine you're going in with basically a, um, a head start on them. You know, and it's, it could be a year, it could be two, it could be three. So it'll be an economic advantage uh, ahead of those countries. Okay. So i uh, just give you an overview of uh, Northern Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland are uh, mandating it from 1st of April 2016. Okay, so BIM Level 2 will be mandatory. Uh, they have a couple of little things in there which are interesting. Uh, mandatory for appropriate construction projects which are procured by a centre of procurement expertise. Um, that might be an interest one. I don't know if Paul knows the answer to that, um, whether it's a deviation slightly from the, the UK standard and maybe Northern Ireland, maybe Scotland have their own uh, slight different versions of it. They seem to have set a, a minimum value as well of uh, 4.3 million uh, for projects. Um, but they do expect main contractors, uh, subcontractors and uh, construction consultants uh, who are bidding for future government contracts they're saying basically should act now to get with BIM. So need to adopt level two uh, work practices in their organizations, develop training for staff, uh, implement the methodology for delivering projects in BIM and promote collaborative working processes. That's really what it's about. Okay, okay so BIM is not mandatory in Ireland uh, at the moment. Um, uh, in fact, there's very few countries really where it is mandatory, although certain state authorities uh, are uh, mandating BIM, let's say, for planning submissions and so on. So countries like Singapore, Denmark, Finland and Holland are uh, sort of leading, leading the pack. UK will be up there um, in 2016, definitely. Uh, it's a strong, um, I think, intention from the UK government to, to mandate BIM. Uh, I think it's going to be, be a lot of people screaming, I think, by the end of the year, but um, I suppose what you can say is it's been around since 2011. It's a five-year uh, warning in some ways, so uh, it'll be interesting to see um, what comes out of that. Uh, we're taking the point of view that we just get on with it. Just this is it. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have time to go moaning around and saying uh, this is too much change. Uh, we're just going to put in standards to meet uh, BIM level two and just get doing it. Okay, so we're very influenced here in Ireland by our nearest neighbour, the UK, and I think in the downturn especially, uh, that sort of heightened influence because uh, I know we're not the only company that basically started looking around when the work ran out here in 2008 and said, where next? Um, we went to uh, Middle East as well, uh, but I think um, our nearest neighbour, the UK, uh, was always the the... The surest bet. It's very close. It's very easy to get to. I've often gone into London quicker than people have got a train down from uh, some parts of Northern England or from Wales, and uh, it's uh, you know the the mindset <coughs> is not dissimilar uh, in the UK as well. The way of doing business. Um, 
So it's actually easy to get on there. Um, we know how things work. Um, so a lot of companies now at the moment would have, you know, offices uh, in the UK or getting work in the UK. So to continue to get that work, uh, we need to get with, the, with BIM. So Ireland, anyways, has traditionally adopted UK standards, and it makes sense for, sense for us to, to adopt them and then to adjust them where necessary for local conditions. So uh, I don't think that it makes economic sense, given the size of our country, to be reproducing uh, BIM standards again. Okay. Uh, there is a risk, I think, of a two-tier system here. Um, those who do BIM and those who don't in Ireland. It's mandated in the UK, so uh, you do it or you don't. If you don't, you won't get the work. Uh, whereas in Ireland, you'll get some work. Uh, you will get work, uh, but it'll likely be slowly ever decreasing as BIM becomes more popular. Okay. Okay, so just bring up the European Union uh, Public Procurement Directive. Uh, this is, there's a change uh, happening, um, and uh, it's, uh, it hasn't mandated BIM, but basically what has happened is all, uh, it's given all 28 member states the opportunity to recommend or require the use of BIM in projects. Um, that's a little bit of a, I say it's not mandated. The reason they put it in uh, is because BIM could have been seen as being anti-competitive in the UK. Um, basically, if one country was saying you can't do work because you don't have these skills or these tools, it would have been anti-competitive. So if you were a company in France coming in, trying to procure for work, and you don't normally use BIM, uh, you, it's, it's basically an anti-competitive system. So what they've done is they've put in this directive anyway that basically uh, allows countries to, to mandate BIM if they require. So, um, so basically, um, for public works <coughs> contracts and design contests, member states may require the use of specific electronic tools, such as building information electronic modelling tools or similar. So the use of BIM will not be mandatory, but the, um, the directive does so go some way in encouraging or pushing member states to recommend or specify the use of BIM. Okay. So that has come into force on 17th of April uh, 2014, and EU member states have two years to implement that. So basically by, I presume, 16th of April next year, um, that every country should, uh, at that point in time, uh, have put in place this directive. Okay. Okay, just to put it in context of the public works contracts uh, and the GCC contracts, um, there was a report in December, and there's a lot of talk about the public uh, work contracts, uh, mostly to do with, I suppose, it's not as performing as intended. Um, a lot of claims with those contracts, um, which is uh, making them very difficult, and they're, they're kind of anti-BIM in some ways, because they're uh, not collaborative. Uh, they're very much uh, um, putting uh, the contractor, the design team, the everyone uh, on different sides of the table, and uh, it's uh, not working out as intended. Uh, the civilian, so what uh, is in that report, it's, it's, it's available online as well, uh, that building information should be considered as a powerful risk management tool. And it goes on to say it has the capacity to re reduce risk exposure to the contracting authority design team and the contractor because the level of information required to generate the model and the level of information provides to the building management team. Uh, so they're saying basically consideration must be given to make it mandatory for projects of a certain scale and complexity. So it's not going all out for every project, but it looks like they'll maybe set some minimum um, uh, value, I suspect, uh, uh, where BIM will be required. Um, at the moment, I suppose, my, our experience is that on some projects, really big ones, uh, BIM is being asked for by governments here, or government agencies here, HSE has uh, asked for it on the, uh, the New Children's Hospital. Uh, there's a few other organisations. Don't name them here now because everything's kind of uh, happening at the moment. But the the it is being asked for, and it's uh, I think you'll likely start to see it as a way of, um, especially on big projects, of trying to filter down the organisations to the ones who can do it. Um, um, so I suppose just watch out for that. Okay. So what they've said in the report as well, that BIM protocols will be developed for inclusion in public works contracts. Uh, I think I've been, someone had told me now, I can't verify it, but 
that there'll be some modification of the CIC protocol um, will be used um, and that'll be put in as an addendum into the actual public works contracts. Okay, okay so just to give you a bit of background, just uh, I suppose what we're doing uh, in BIM. So <clears throat> um, we're at the moment the majority of new projects require BIM. I'd say probably every new project that came in the door in the last six months has BIM. Uh, so just shows you just the, it's all changed. And I've got to say the change probably happened pretty much about five, six months ago. The economy seems to be uh, coming back on track again and uh, BIM is, is, is being required. We're working on some quite very big projects at the moment. One in London is the University College London Hospital. Uh, I'll show you some images of that and just to explain a little bit about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, the, we're doing a laboratory for Purbright, University of Surrey. Um, that's the STEM building, that's in BIM. So those are all mandatory BIM projects. Parky Cueve wasn't mandatory, but we're doing it anyway because we agreed as a design team that we do it in BIM. Uh, School of Biological Sciences for Queen's University, that's mandatory BIM. Business and Innovation Hub, Trinity College, uh, it's in Ireland, but they mandated BIM, level two as well. So there's an example of a, an Irish uh, client who's looking for BIM. Uh, University of Ulster, uh, this is a project we'll be uh, about to kick off on shortly, 85,000 square metres of BIM. So it's a very, very big project. And uh, the brewery quarter in Cork, uh, along with BAM, <coughs> uh, that's, that's BIM. Okay, I'm gonna, sorry, I'll give you some examples. That's the uh, Photon Beam Therapy Centre in London. Uh, just give you an example of the model. Uh, very big hospital, about six floors above, uh, above another five below ground, so very big. BIM was very useful for actually uh, trying to uh, manage the complexity of that building. Um, the problem is we have really big equipment down the ground floor, about 10 metres high. Trying to get that into the building is really, really complicated. Okay, just another example just of the model there. You can see the guy here, that's the size of the equipment. So what you see in that box down the bottom, that's part of it there, you see. So it's really big equipment in the ground. So for, in terms of coordination, uh, it was extremely beneficial. That's the building above ground. Um, you can see it's, a, it's an L-shaped building. This is on Tottenham Court Road, a really busy city centre site. And uh, the model was brought in to uh, Navisworks Works and a few other applications. We're actually able to do time-based analysis to see how things work, how loading would come in, how, the, how we get things in on time. Uh, we even designed the actual... Uh, lifting gear as well, uh, using BIM. I looked at the options in the headroom and so on. Okay, that's the equipment down the basement, particle accelerator. Um, <coughs> this is all, uh, the actual suppliers built the model for us. Not keenly at first, but basically they, 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 they got it done. And we were able to actually then visualize the space it took up, uh, look at the actual, how the spaces uh, worked with that equipment. And then we're able to basically give some verification that everything fit in the building and that we could get it in as well. Okay, that's the equipment. You can see it, each one of those <coughs> in the basement. That's just a cut through it. They're about 10 metres high, so it gives you the scale of it, and that's the particle accelerator down the bottom. So the visual is just uh, absolutely brilliant. And that's how it looks. It doesn't look so complicated when you're uh, getting the treatment. It's cancer uh, treatment, so it's for children and for uh, people with brain tumours. Parky Cueve, um, that's down Cork, that's uh, been done in BIM, that's going out to uh, for tender at the moment. Uh, School of Biological Sciences in, uh, in uh, Belfast for Queen's University. Uh, all the equipment has all been tagged, information put on that, so we'll be extracting that out uh, from that. There are just some of the applications we're using at the moment. We're using Revit 2014 and 15 Navis Works. Uh, ADB, which is a healthcare system, Codebook as well, which is healthcare. They're databases that help us uh, define the brief for the project. And what we can do is we can initially say, look, we're going to have this room with this type of equipment, and then we're ready, then we can populate the model with that information. Okay, so using 3D Studio, NBS building, A site is our preferred CDE, but we're also using Conject, Huddle, and Four Projects. Okay, I'll skip down through a couple of things because I just want to get to the end. Um, just a couple of main points. Top-down approach is really important, very important. And you need to get the uh, partners and directors, whoever runs your business, on board for it. You need a strategy for BIM, so it's just a steering group. Uh, you need to look at procurement projects. 
uh, your capability for BIM and uh, can you respond to an employer's information requirements. Um, that's one thing we're going to bring out a template for shortly is uh, for employers' information requirements um, because there's not really um, some good ones, but there's a lot of non-existent and sometimes not uh, very well put together ones. Okay, the um, information manager is a very key ro role. Uh, there are more roles in the BIM process, but uh, that person is uh, going to be a very, very busy person. Okay. So, I uh, just want to get to the, I'm going to skip, I'm now just tight in time, so what I want to do is I just want to get down to the, you'll have access to the presentation, I just want to get down to the, um, the last one here. Okay, so uh, as part of the RI AI BIM committee, um, we produce a BIM uh, uh, execution plan template. Okay, this responds to the employer's information requirements uh, document and explains in detail basically what the supplier's methodology for delivering a project in BIM. So the process basically is, you are supposed to, let's say as a client, produce an EIR, which is your brief for BIM. Uh, if you haven't, let's say, already done it, you'll need to basically uh, assess the capability of each company, and that'll be through a, a sort of a short form survey of each company. That'll go out as part of the tender. The first response is pre-contract BIM execution plan, I've seen sort of shortened versions and, and full BIM execution plans come back, but that BIM execution plan um, ultimately needs to be there when the project starts. And what we've done is we've put together what we think at the moment is the best of PAS 1192 Part 2, uh, and it's based on the format in the uh, CPIC document. Okay, So it's a draft still, but we're suggesting that it's the best of what's out there at the moment that we have in Ireland. Uh, when the BIM toolkit comes out in the UK, uh, it's looking like April, we'll update it again and hopefully then we'll get to something more final. There's quite a few little outstanding things like the Uniclass system looks like it's going to version 3 and so on. So we need to basically get those pinned down before we put out the, the final release. Um, so that'll be, I think as far as I know, it'll be emailed out to everyone. Um, so you can uh, have a look through that. It's a template. so. You can look at it and take it and modify it to suit your needs, uh, but we've considered quite a lot of things in that document. I think it's quite clear as well what needs to be completed at each section and there's some guidance as well. And I think in time we'll do some guidance on that document as well. Okay. So future documents then we'd like to include our employer's information requirements template, uh, BIM capability assessment forms to give some guidance on that, uh, guidance on BIM roles and guidance on common data environment. Um, that'll be future items. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. All right. Thank you.